thought to start the slideshow with something that I did when I was 25. When I uh, had, um, I was in my final year of art studies. And it was like, uh, uh, this thing, you can see it, yeah. So, I was living in a small flat in the Obra, and I needed to get a sculpture into the flat, and I wanted to make big stuff. And so I made something that could squeeze through the front door, and then when it's inside, I could fold it open like this. And the idea was to make a sculpture of Hilbrow, if I can put it shortly. So it seems to have some streets with buildings and so on. It was started in 1975, I think. And uh, in 1996, I don't know, it's 95. I was um, breaking away from teaching just to become a full-time artist and some architect showed an interest in the work and bargained nicely and because I needed the money urgently I sold it for about a thousand five hundred rand and I think it's worth about two million rand now. So. <laughs> uh, 1996, 93, 94, somewhere around 93, I can't remember the date exactly. My friend, Professor Franz Ballon, professor in, in law at the University of Johannesburg, he was appointed as a High Court judge. He's now also living here in Bloemfontein for some of his year. He's now an an appellate judge from at the appellate court and the university wanted to buy him a go away present so they he found out that they wanted to buy uh, from a gallery in um, in Johannesburg uh, uh, one of these girls that hang in a tree with a leopard skin dress. <laughs> so he freaked out and he asked them please to come and talk to me. Then they came and talked for a long time but they didn't have too much money. So I said all right well I'll take the money and I'll make a sculpture uh, for, for Professor Marlon and he must please also come and help me make the sculpture got some ideas, but he will receive the first of 15, or he will receive the prototype of 15, and then I will make 15 sort of in a, in addition, so that I can recover some costs. And uh, we sat a few nights talking about this, and my idea was that in the book of Proverbs, um, they mention seven pillars of wisdom and they don't tell us what they are so i thought we should make a sculpture reflecting the seven pillars of justice because he's now going to be in a new job as a senior judge and he will he should know what the seven pillars of justice are and he should tell me so he went away and then he came back a week later and he had a big frown on his head. What's going on? You no, know, he can't. He, he has seven, but he, he can't think of anything in Afrikaans or English. He has them in Latin. I think, oh, you know, that's fantastic. Because uh, Justicia, that goddess of justice, she has a scale in her hand. She must weigh up pros and cons of every case. But she's blindfolded. And because she's blind, I think 
If you have your stuff in Latin, I'll put it in Braille, so that no one can actually figure out what it says. Justice is blind. So we've got the seven pillars. And he also told me, justice has two, um, the two sides to justice. The one side is what the law says. The law is written. It's cast in stone. And uh, one can't change it. And you have to stay with the law. You can't invent the law, bend the law. That's the one side of justice. But at the same time, one has to remember that the law, that, that you are dealing with people. And people are flesh and blood. And they make mistakes. And so we had to build this aspect of the law, which is cast in stone, and the people who are flesh and blood into this kind of seven pillar construct. So this was the result. We made a puzzle of seven pillars, and in the center of the puzzle you can see a sort of red square, and around it you can see more brown, gray, Wood. The brown grey wood is lead wood, the red square in the middle is Zimbabwe teak. And that red, somehow we felt each one of the seven pillars must have some red on it. And um, that reflects the fact that we are flesh and blood. And on the outside, impenetrable grey lead wood suggests that the law can't be changed. It's not up to the judge to mess around with the law, the law is cast in stone. And um, the Latin uh, say things like Audi alter in partem, which means you have to listen to the other side. Every court case uh, has... You, you can't only give one side a chance, you must listen to everybody else's point of view as well, to the other people there as well. Another one was, I can remember, Nemo Iudex in Sua Causa. It means you will not be a judge in your own defense. You, if you go to court, you are not the one to decide whether your stuff is right or wrong. An impartial judge should decide. So there's seven pillars like that. This just shows how that seven pillars can drift apart. Um, then, I think one sometimes makes art for, for me, I make it for many reasons, and most of my work will have some sense of text or language in it. And in this case, um, I was asked to um, make an artwork for the main lawn at Kirstenbosch. And I study plants quite a lot, and I know that we have more than 30,000 plants on the red data list. So I wanted to show if these plants are lost, what it might look like. But it's very difficult because 30,000 is a huge number. And I used poppies because in uh, Belgium, you have the poppy fields and you have lots and lots of memorial gardens for soldiers. When the soldiers die somewhere, they never come back, nobody knows what's happened to them. After the war, sometimes they make memorial gardens. And the same for plants. If these 30,000 plants, we are told, within the next 100 or 200 years will all be gone. So what I'm doing, I'm making a memorial garden to show already now what it will look like if these plants are gone. And, uh, that, uh, that's an international conference of uh, economics and people are walking around but um, I've only managed to put 15,000 plants there uh, and it filled up the whole garden. So I'd have to go more than twice that size to show the extent to which 30,000. I know somewhere in Ypres and in, on the west side of Belgium you have sometimes a million soldiers gone. And then you have field upon field upon field of little white stakes or crosses. 
this was another. This work has been shown um, in France and around South Africa. Now, these plants are going to get lost. These are also plants, but um, I used them in a more intimate setting. This is one of the pavilions uh, in, in, a, in a home. Uh, this, I think this, this is the, um, this would be the, maybe this work has come, <laughs> it would be in the North Pavilion, made of steel. And people sleep in it and they live in it. The South Pavilion is made of glass. And there's a swimming pool between the two. This is the recreation area. But the North Pavilion has movable uh, walls. They run on tracks. And the plants that I reflect here are, you can see that they are in layers, text. They are the plants that will never get lost because they are things that we use in the kitchen, things like lemon and oregon, margarine, rosemary. But they are written in all the languages of the world. So you can see that the sun would shine through the text and sometimes if you sit on your bed you'd have lots of some funny stuff written on your stomach. <laughs> and that's the bathroom. You can just pull the screens along and then nobody can actually see you having a bath unless if they come very close and take a peek through a, through a letter. <laughs> so this is the steel pavilion. Shows various views, slightly distant. And then the text runs crazy when the sun shines through it. It runs up and down walls and so on. This is the glass pavilion. The glass pavilion, the problem there was that people walk into glass. And so I used less text just to hint at some grassy field, a reed field, so that people might not break their noses. And then sometime in the 80s I had uh, some altercation with people. Um, they, you know, I have an accent. I don't speak uh, English without an accent. But um, Sometimes people think that because one has a strange accent, you must also be a little bit stupid. And they use strange words to try and upstage you, you know, to make you feel small. So I thought um, I should do something about that. And then every night for seven or eight hours, I went to, <laughs> to all the dictionaries I could find and wrote down all the words I didn't know. And I bought tapes and learned strange words. I did this for a few years without telling anyone. It was a secret. <laughs> and uh, then, after some time, we had some great fun when they discovered that they, you know, whatever words they used, other people also know those words. And I started launching strange words on, on, on the intelligentsia. Words like cataclysm, which you should learn. <laughs> Ulotriges, ectaises. Onolatry has a history. Um, it comes from a few centuries back when the Crusaders went to Palestine. And the people who lived there wouldn't listen. And uh, lots of unhappiness and sadness resulted. Don't believe what I tell you to believe, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> but I'm doing it in love. So they went back to Europe, to their various cloisters and religious orders. And some, sometime in England they spread the word that those horrible people who won't listen, you know, it's not worth it. Those people worship donkeys. They are on knowledge. So it's a sad word. It's still in the Oxford English Dictionary, in the big one. Um, and uh, the next one tells you something about myself. If you 
cut your beard, which most of you as gentlemen might do, you are a pognotomist. Toma in Greek means to cut, like a lobotomy is the cutting off of the top of your head. And a pognotomy is the cutting of a beard. But I'm a pognotrophist. I... <laughs> so there's a nice list of stuff. I thought at one stage, well, I think the science of ignorance, agnoiology, is my favorite uh, subject at university. Uh, Ethiopian, you have a deep bosom. The people who wrote Oxford, the dictionary, they are men. And the word bathos in Greek means deep, corpus means throat. So literally you have a deep throat or cleavage. Because they are men, they sort of, through time, adopted the idea that bathocorpion means having big breasts. <laughs> it has nothing to do with breasts. Their heads made it up. So since that time I've probably written about 15 dictionaries or so just to try and learn English. And I wanted to build 11 walls. This is a, one of the walls. There are 50 bricks on this side, 25 times 2. And of course, uh, at the other end, uh, it has a left hand and a right hand. At the other end, there will be 50. So 100 bricks on the ends of this wall. And then, uh, I think that would be 450, and the other side would be 450, that's 900. So each wall will have a thousand bricks. And then I want to write in nine of the walls, uh, ten, 10 of the walls. I'll have a Zulu wall, a Koza wall, a Venda wall, and in the Zulu wall, for example, I will write cataglottism, but the, the um, explanation will be in Zulu. Or I would write uh, Skiamaki, the last one, and the explanation would be in Zulu, fighting with shadow. Um, it's what one does if you can't sleep. Something to do with your conscience bothering you. Or matoid. Like in the, sort of almost in the middle there. If you're really very clever and you're also very crazy. I know a few people like that. So the words are usable. And I want to put these walls in public places. So I, I want to use expensive materials to make it attractive. And the lady that sells the bananas and the tomatoes on the street corner they can most of the time they can read and write English or even whatever their languages are, Zulu or Koza or Sutu. And uh, the English professor would come along. And I doubt very much if any English professor would know any of these words. I've spent four years preparing this dictionary of, I call it the dictionary of perplexing English. It's perplexing to me and I'm hoping that it would be perplexing to the English intelligentsia and the lady that sells tomatoes who is thought to be stupid or who is thought to be she's actually really not stupid she can actually speak english and the english professor can probably not speak a word of Koza or Zulu or whatever she can come to his aid she can rescue him she can help him to understand difficult english his sort of basking in an agnoiologist uh, mists of not knowing and she will deliver him from that <laughs> and he can give her five hands for everything she tells him and she can get far more rich out of teaching him English than selling the tomatoes so I tested this principle of <clears throat> how far am I? So I've got 15 minutes left. Um, by making this work for blind people, by using difficult words and 
using shapes. It's called the Blind Alphabet. And at this exhibition, there are 350 sort of uh, units. And blind people have to explain to people who can see what's going on. So it consists of these boxes. In each box there's a sculpture, a sculpture like that. The sculpture will be named by Sipitus and by Cordal. It means having two heads and having two tails. And the blind person would then read what wood it's made of. It would read by Sipitus, Kaput, Latin means head. By means two, and it would explain a little bit about the sculpture. And there is a South African artist by the name of Jochen Schoenfeld who actually makes sculptures a bit like this. So blind people get to know other artists through the strange work. Bustrophedon is um, the shape of a, an ox that plows the land. The word in Greek, bus means ox. Strophe in Greek means line. An ox plows from left to right and then it plows back. They turn it around at the end of the land and it plows in this. And that, that um, method of plowing in ancient Greek was also the method in which the first Greek writing took place. They didn't write from left to right. They wrote from left to right, and then they wrote back, sometimes backwards. It's like an ox plows. So, so all of these strange and wonderful ideas that come from the dictionary, I ask blind people to help uh, the poor sighted people to see. This work, Caducity, or um, Cadere in Latin means to fall. And at a certain time of the year, uh, some trees develop yellow leaves. And at some time, those leaves will fall off. Whilst other trees, their leaves become yellow a little bit later. And their caducity takes place a little bit later. So some things are, some fruits are caduceus more early than other fruits. So what the blind person would do, would read all this explanation and uh, usually the sighted people haven't got a clue because all around the work it says don't touch, don't touch. That's the thing that it says in all the art galleries. And then poor sighted people are totally frustrated and the blind people have to deliver them and help them and save them. Usually it's us helping the blind people. And it's us coming to the rescue of these poor people. I want the, the, I want the life to be turned around. I want them to help us. It's about time we've been, you know, we've, we've, done, we've been good enough to them. It's their turn now. They must come up and do something for us. So they would pull this little plug and what would happen? It would fall down like that. It's a very naughty work actually by the looks of it. <laughs> <coughs> But it's caduceus when you pull the plug. Oops, it falls down. And blind men, can you imagine that they don't even have frustration at not being able to look at Asla? And what do you call this other stuff? They don't see it because it's not there for them. So I, I, I think in my exhibitions, wherever I have shown this artwork, there's usually a group of blind men grouping around this particular sculpture and grinning their heads off. It's called uh, Kalipidian or Kalipidius. Kalos in Greek means beautiful, like in calligraphy, beautiful writing. And Puche in Greek means buttocks. So if you are Kalipidian, you have beautiful buttocks. And that's the Bastocopian sculpture with a deep chest which obviously is also big-breasted. Um, a cilium is an eyelash. 
And if you talk about the upper side of your eyelid, where on top of your eyelashes, you talk about the supra side of your eye. And if you walk around looking down upon people, showing them the upper side of your eyelashes, your cilia, each and every cilium being sort of there where people can see them in full view, they can only see the top of your eyelid, we say that you are supercilious. That's where it comes from. So blind people would tell other people these things and make people smile and laugh and so on. So work is uh, supposed to make people feel good about themselves. So I work with dictionaries and lots of text. Here's a dictionary written in sand of isms and ologies. And uh, at the end of my exit, this, this particular uh, photograph is from a castle in France, Champlit. And at the end of the exhibition, uh, when they, they have to now send all the work back, they have to find the broom and sweep my work out. That work is very really loose, it's just like a carpet, as you can see there. So sometimes I bring homage to people. In this case I brought homage to eight people who were jailed in 1964. You can see there. The longest one, 9,377 days, marked on a sheet like that, and sandblasted on granite. I mean, you, can't, you can't see it, it's just very faint. That's in the Constitutional Court, that's in a private garden. We spoke about the Crusades. I was in New York on a subway, suddenly I saw an advert from an, an insurance company. They say that they have launched this wonderful crusade. And right in the middle of the word crusade, look what's there. So I thought about Iraq and Afghanistan, and I got very angry and I made it work. Crusades usually have lots of crosses, because it's a, the cruise is a cross. And those are the crosses at the back. And the U and the S and the A are made from very sharp pointed African hardwoods. And uh, at the time of the Iraq war, France didn't join in. And the Americans hate the France because of French because of that. They even changed uh, French fries in America to become freedom fries. Uh, they were crossed with Chirac because he wouldn't join the Iraq war. But it turned out that the Iraq war was a scam. And this work was bought by a French collector from Paris. Lots of crosses. In this work, it says stuff like, I have a big problem with women. I have a big problem with God. I have a big problem with Allah. I have a big problem with Yahweh. I have a big problem with peace. And I found that all the world's good things, all the noble things, the things that are precious and vulnerable, are exploited. People are taking fat chances with really nice things. And that's why I have a problem with these things. And I'm spelling it out in no uncertain terms. The material that I use is chicken shit. And sheep shit. I want to make a point. And it's hanging in a very big collector in Johannesburg. It's hanging in his dining room. <laughs> that's my son Martin making this work says fucking beautiful. <laughs> this work is made from lots and lots of uh, cheap Chinese jewelry. It says fucking ugly. <laughs> I 
had this collection of ties since high school and added onto them and uh, exhibited them like this. And under each tie is a nameplate, as you can see. The one nameplate says O.J. Simpson, two. Mao Tse Tung, 49 million. Jeffrey Dahmer, 17. Donald Henry Rumsfeld, 1.5 million. Tony Blair, 1.2 million. <laughs> it was bought by uh, Richard Branson. This work says, <laughs> if I can read it right, with the greatest respect for your religious persuasion, your sexual orientation, your political bias, race and nationality, I send you straight to hell. This work says 1% chance of peace deserves 100% effort. Some naughty school kids wrote over the word peace, they wrote war. And that it is signed by God, supposedly, and some other naughty kid put those other names, Cheney, Bush, Blair, and Rumsfeld, and so on in there. One percent chance of war deserves a hundred percent effort. So sometimes I get really angry, and then I think of a way in which I can make trouble. This work's called Scoop, S-K-O-O-B. It's got Koran, Bible, opened at the most important places because I think those are the most abused books in the world. And I've stoned them with those white stones. So they are, the stones actually act as paperweights. They just keep the Bibles open on the places where it speaks about love and the Ten Commandments and so on. Because I think people have abused those books. Um, the word scoop, S-K-O-O-B, means to destroy books. To burn them, or to throw them in the, in the sea, or to bury them. And in my case, to stone them. To turn them into grave grave uh, graves. Uh, and uh, if you spell the word S-K-O-O-B backwards, it's in the Oxford English Dictionary. It means to destroy books. B O O K S. Raw material, polished, and finished. It's called Penelope's Distaff. The text. Penelope. Long story. I don't want to tell you the story. If you want to know more about the work, you must. Look at my website or go on the internet and Google it. My time is almost up. And then I bring homage to the Fort asteroid at the beginning of language. We speak and we write and we use language as uh, a way of uh, communication. All living things, I think, can communicate and have a way of uh, signaling and of getting their uh, wishes known, I think is the word perhaps. Birds, animals, insects, all of them, even plants. And I wanted to celebrate the fact that we can talk and the fact that we exist. And uh, this is in the cradle of humankind to the west of Johannesburg, where the Fredefort asteroid uh, made ripples go through the landscape so that lots and lots of thousands of caves formed two billion years ago. And that caused the seas to drain away, the forests to diminish, and for some animals to uh, uh, leave the forests and begin to uh, live off the grass, grassy fields, and eat the seeds, and those animals would be us. So I'm celebrating our own beginning as well. You can sit on the one rock, and the other rock behind you is just as a back, backdrop. The rock behind is about 10 tons, and the rock in front is about 3 tons.
birds also like them. They, they, they like sitting on them and leave a nice white snow, snowy deposit. So all the languages of the world are there. There are six of these rocks. This is a pear. That's one that's exhibited in the felt. Not near any building. You come around the corner and there it is. And that's another one, about a three-ton one. It's a splinter of some black, Belfast black granite polished. I wanted it to look like some rock had fallen out of the sky at night. And that's about a ten-ton rock near the cradle restaurant. And I think that's the end of it. Thank you very much.